Good afternoon. I guess good morning. It's morning everywhere. <laughs> good morning. Thanks for joining us today. We have Gary O'Connor from Manita Gold, who's going to talk about the updated resource that they put out this week. As always, this presentation will contain forward-looking statements. If you'd like to know more about those, you can check them out on the company's disclosure on their website, and there will be a Q&A section, so feel free to input your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom. And with that out of the way, I'd like to introduce Gary, who's going to tell us a little bit about the, the update they put out, and then we'll do a bit of a Q&A. Hi, Gary. Hi, Deborah, and thank you for the opportunity to present our, our much-awaited updated resource. So I really do appreciate the, the opportunity. Yeah, well, congrats on the release. It's a massive resource. I think one of the biggest undeveloped uh, gold projects in the country. So looking forward to hearing a little bit more detail about it. No, excellent. Thank you very much. And we're extremely pleased and happy with the results of the resource update. You know, we added a significant amount of resources to our resource base. You know, we, we had a 70% increase in total contained gold in the inferred category. We're now at 7.5 million ounces. Uh, that's total resources. That's an additional 3.1 million ounces over our previous inferred resources. We also had a significant increase in our indicated resources, another 300,000 ounces to a new total of 4.3 million ounces of you know, combined open pit and underground resources. Remember, the project was not focused on upgrading resources. The project last year was about adding resources, connecting deposits, infilling pits, and all of this we were been very successful at achieving. But we're lucky to have actually up increased our indicated resources as well. The good thing is we've added these significant increase to our resources with an actual increase in the grade of our underground resources. You know, our indicated is up 22%, our inferred is up 2%, and there's no material change in our overall average grade of our open pit resources. So we, we do not lose um, any grade there for, for the open pit resources. For the open pit resources, we had a 25% increase to 4.2 million ounces and 156% increase in inferred resources to 5.8 million ounces in, in total open pit resources, both in the inferred and, and previously mentioned indicated categories. We increased our grade at the garrison starter pit. Remember, this is the area we're proposing to have our starter pit for the pending PEA. We have 1.75 million ounces now at a grade of 1.07 in our starter pit. That is all in the indicated category. We have an additional 4 million ounces inferred to add to that. We've actually added a new high-grade open pit at Westaway. It contains 1.1 million ounces at over 2 grams. That's in the inferred category. We've re-established an open pit at Southwest. This contains over 300,000 ounces indicated and 1.2 million ounces inferred resources. These are all new additions. And of course, the infill program on our Windjammer pit is added, as now contains 1.76 million ounces indicated and 2.4 million ounces gold inferred resources. So that pit has been uh, infilled. It's been expanded through the gap area. It connects with Southwest. And then in the western part of the area, the Westaway and 55 open pit resources have combined. Uh, we've still maintained good underground resources. We've increased the grade there and expanded our open pit resources with no loss in grade. So we see the these has been a good foundation for our PEA moving forward. Gives us lots of optionality into uh, scheduling of resources, scheduling of a process mine feed. So we're looking forward to having the PEA out at the end of June and. We're really uh, happy with these resources and happy with the, the direction the company's going. So, so thank you, Deborah. Well, you've accomplished a lot in the last, I think it is, two years uh, in terms of asset growth and, and development and acquisitions and things like that. So it's been a pretty impressive time for Manita. So I had a couple of questions about the resource updates, and maybe we could start there before talking about you know company strategy, et cetera. So my first question is, uh, can you tell us which of the nine pit deposits at Tower grew the most, and how much of this growth was on strike versus down dip? Okay, so the, the pits, open pits that have grown the most is the Windjammer pit. It is, now, it is now expanded through the gap area. We drilled that last year, confirmed continuous mineralization, and it now extends into the southwest area where uh, previously, there had been open pit resources, but re-established those. The pit actually pushes far enough forward to capture some of the discovery and Windjammer North areas in the pit. So we not only have we got Windjammer South, we have Windjammer Central, 
discovery, including the Windjammer North area and the southwest deposits are all captured in this one pit. So that that is the pit that expanded the most. The pit that increased the most by grade is the Westaway 55 pit. That's significant grade there. And then we also, as mentioned, a significant increase in grade on the garrison pits, uh, notably 903 and Garcon. Can you talk a little bit about those drivers of growth in grade and in, in underground resources, especially in the indicated category? Yes, so we did increase the grade of our underground resources. And that was a big plus. We are still looking to have underground feed to increase the overall grade of our deposit, reduce the plant size required. Some of our underground previous underground resources at Westaway and Southwest have been converted to open pit resources. They are now captured in the open pits. So some of those ounces were converted, and this has resulted actually in still a very good wide zones. Remember the Westaway drill intercepts were 15 to 30 metre true widths on these zones, good grade. And as mentioned, we've, we've increased that grade significantly in regards to our current underground resources. And of course, the, the other big takeaway is we've now established some underground resources at on the Garrison project. There previously was no underground resources there. We've established some underground resources at a grade of over five grams per tonne. And we look to continue to grow that as we develop the project. It, it will provide another underground high grade feed for our processing plant during the, you know, during the production years. Will those underground resources be included in the PEA? Uh, yes, they will. The current plan is to include the Westaway and Southwest resources. We're, we're currently doing mine to mill trade-off studies in regards to the sequencing. Currently, it looks like it's best to bring those in early, keep get the grade in early, have the highest grade ore early in the, the mine plan, results in you know a faster payback. And so that's the current thoughts and the current planning. But we'll see how the you know this the trade-off studies are underway. And we only just got the final resource yesterday, so some of those numbers we're, st we're still working on. Got it. How many meters were drilled at Tower since the December 2020 resource? And are they all incorporated in the latest update? That's correct. So last year, we completed a 72,500 meter drill program, 130 drill holes. This, remember, this was all targeted at expanding resources, testing between previous resources, between previous drilling. So it was all focused on, you know, expanding inferred resources. We're very successful at doing that. Uh, remember that the project itself has has 150,000 meters of, of drilling on it, you know, and we have all of that core. It's all in our core farms in the Timmins camp. It's all undercover. It's it's in good condition and it's all documented. So that additional 72,500 meters was another addition to our resource database, you know, inventory. Okay, got it. And can you talk a little bit about the drilling that you're doing in 2022? Uh, so this year we're penciled at 70,000 meters. A small portion of that is exploration drilling. We have conducted some of that already. So we do have assays pending. That was targeting areas outside of the current resources. So the, the point of that is to show, a, you know, a, a really a pipeline of projects so that we can continue to to add ounces and deposits to the deposit and we can find more high grade mineralization. We will add that, you know, to the mine life. But the majority of the drilling is is focused on resource upgrade drilling. We've already started our pre-feasibility drilling. We're doing infill drilling. We're upgrading inferred to indicated resources and we'll have a good flow of news out on that very soon. And we're getting a head start in, in regards to our pre-feasibility studies by conducting that drilling now and upgrading our resources. Got it. So that'll be included not in the PEA, but in the PFS, which I think you said is due out mid-year next year. Correct. We'll release the PEA if we're currently still plant looking at, you know, late June this year. We'll then immediately start the PFS. We've already started the drilling. We haven't given the contracts yet. We do need to wait for the PEA to, to base those on, but we're currently targeting at the second half of next year to complete that study. Okay. And maybe we could talk a little bit about what else you're doing in terms of metallurgy hydro, what do they call it? Hydro drilling, things like that as you move towards the feasibility stage. Maybe you can give an update on, on other activities. As part of the PFS, we'll be doing additional, you know, studies, as you mentioned, there'll be pre-feasibility level studies. Yeah, the hydrological studies you refer to, you know, looking just um, water management, there'll be, you know, geotechnical studies in regards to the, you know, the rock mechanics of, of the, the actual ore and the and the underground, of course, open pit parameters. We're also be doing more metallurgical test work, uh, environmental sampling. We do have our environmental baseline ongoing. 
It's been going now for nearly two years. By midway through next year, we'll have all of that data completed and we should have that wrapped up and, uh, and have enough information and data, baseline data to permit the project. All of those things will be defined in the, you know, with the PFS scope when we grant that upon, you know, delivery of the PEA late, you know, in the coming months. Right. And can you talk a little bit about your CSR and engagement with the local communities? Yes, our community engagement is ongoing. We have a exploration agreement in place with the Wagashig First Nations. We've just hired, as of late last year, a director of sustainability, Vince Deschamps. He has many years of exp- ex- um, experience internationally within Canada, both in regards to environmental baseline collection data, um, community engagement studies. So that is ongoing. We have now have a task force in place with with the Wagashig First Nation to, they are already uh, engaged in the development of the PEA. We've got them at the table early and we're, we're looking to have, you know, to continue a good working relationship with them. And I think it's really important for the permitting process, which is the next thing I wanted to ask you about. Can you speak about what that permitting process involves and sort of where you're at in, in those steps? Okay, the permitting proper for the for the project will start once we have the environmental baseline data completed once we have an EIA compiled. So we're looking potentially at the second half of next year. We would need a project description. We'll see if we if the quality detail of the PFS is sufficient to, for that. Otherwise it'll be we'll develop something fairly soon after. But we're looking to have that all, you know, ready to go or at least in the preparation stage for the second half of next year. Okay, great. And I know I've asked you this in the past, but the overall strategy for the company, I mean, you've got these multiple pits. I think there's nine of them that you've defined so far. Is the strategy to have one centralized facility and bring ore from the various different pits or would it require more than one plant? Oh, no, the the plan is to have one centralized facility. Remember, we've actually drilled out the deposits over a combined nine-kilometer strike length. There is a four-kilometer break in the middle between the two clusters of uh, deposits. However, we're looking to have just one central plant, one facility, central, sort of equidistant to the most far distal uh, deposits in regards to efficiency for all, all times, distances. So we do we do have, there is land there to put it and we see that as the best, you know, the best way forward, um, both economically and operationally. I'm assuming we'll get more details about what that'll look like with the PEA and the PFS. That's correct. The, the PEA will define our first, you know, scoping level definition of that. And then we'll be looking at where we get to, you know, more detailed with the forthcoming PFS. One of the things that we haven't talked about is your access to infrastructure with the project. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that because I think it's an important detail for people to understand how close you are to, you know, highways, to um, major cities where there's skilled labor, et cetera. No, correct. We're we're in the Timmins Gold Camp. Remember, this is Canada's most prolific gold camp. There's multiple operating mills, operations, mines around us. We're located immediately adjacent to Highway 101. Highway 101 is the major regional highway that actually follows the Desta Porcupine Fault Zone. That's the major controlling structure around which, you know, the deposits do exist. There's operating mills just to the east of us, to the west. There's, There's power. There's skilled workforce in Timmins. We have no need to put in, you know, access roads. There's no need for fly and fly out camps. Uh, there's no need to for long, you know, distances or big expense to to bring in the utilities and and other required infrastructure. Workers can drive home at night. Um, you know, Kirk and Lake is only sixty kilometres to the south. Timmins is only hundred kilometres to the west. So we're in a very prime location in regards to infrastructure and logistics. Got it. Well. I think that's extremely important these days. I had a couple of audience questions, stepping back a little bit to talk about the resource again. And then I do want to talk about the overall strategy for the company and some of the strategic relationships you have. Could you tell us whether the underground resource depth went down or increased and, and to what extent? So we did not conduct any additional drilling at Southwest. The Southwest drilling was based on the December 2020 resource. So there was no additional drilling completed there. Some of the Southwest underground resources have been converted to open and thus cheaper, you know, development ounces. 
At Westaway, however, we did significant step outs. We were doing 100 meter step outs. We extended the deposit 400 meters at depth and to the west. So that's where we, the Westaway deposit has gone from 660,000 ounces in the last resource to, to 1.5 million ounces in the new resource. This is all inferred resources, but that deposit extended, you know, over wide widths to, and over good step outs. The, the last holes we drilled there were still intersecting 15, 30 meter zones. They, that deposit is open to depth. So we had a lot of ounces there. Some has is now captured in the open pit, but the underground resources have extended significantly to depth and they are still open. Okay, thank you. So yeah, just talking a little bit about your relationship with O3, uh, who you acquired the garrison portion of Tower from, I believe in February, 2021. What is O3's current interest and the relationship between the companies? Uh, O3 is a great supporter of us and a great shareholder. Um, they have 27% of the company. Remember, it was an all-share deal to acquire Garrison. They have board representation. They're on our technical committee, audit committee. They give us guidance. They give us support. Um, they've been very good shareholders and some of our best uh, best voices on the in the market. So we're, we're really happy to have them as as shareholders, they see the vision and where we're going. They want to be part of a major expanded project. And as I know Jose has said on, you know, interviews, that their goal in life is to add, is to find ounces and develop ounces. And that's exactly what we're doing for them. We've been discovering ounces at less than $4 Canadian an ounce. And so they're very happy with their, their investment in us. And they I know they want to stay as key investors and in what's, you know, a large growing and advancing a gold project. Great. Well, it's good to have uh, great partners. And I think if I remember correctly, you have a joint venture with Agnico Eagle um, just south of the tower project. Is that right? That's correct. We have a large joint venture. It's now with Agnico Eagle. It, it came with their acquisition of Kirk and Lake Gold. We have had discussions with them. So we'll see where we go on that. There's, they've got land. That joint venture covers land to the south as well as some to the west and to the east of Tower Gold. But some of the land is on prospective ground, so it would be, be good to, to add some value there. I should point out we we do also have other projects away from Tower. We do have a pipeline. We, we will be doing a small amount of work on those. These are previously producing projects, some in high-grade uh, situations, so we the market will get to see that there is there are more projects in our portfolio and we'll we'll get those out to the market to get some valuation for them over the you know over the coming months but it it won't be our core function but it's just something we think we should we should uh we get some valuation for that's all okay so right now like is there any work being done in the jv with agnico eagle um and what is the agreement in, in place there's currently no work being done agnico eagle has only just you know completed the merger with Gherkin lake so they're still getting up to speed on you know the nature of the joint vent of the joint venture ground. There is actually no joint venture agreement in place. There are agreements in regards to the ownership and the percentage ownership of the ground. So we we know what our each party's ownership is, and we'll look to put to an actual formal joint venture to define the terms of it, advancing that ground. Got it. Okay. And then talking about the PEA again, I, I believe that you had projects that have had PEAs on them before. So I think that's Golden Highway and Garrison. So how are you expecting that the new PEA will be different in terms of mining processing, uh, infrastructure, project scale options, et cetera? Maybe you can talk to that a little bit. Okay, so the the previous PEAs were conducted on Southwest. It was an underground PEA on the Golden Highway area. That's correct. It was completed in September 2020. It showed 80,000 ounces production a year from an underground bulk tonnage mining operation. In December 2020, a PA was conducted on the Garrison project by O3 Mining. It showed an open pit mining scenario, 125,000 ounces a year production, both good cash costs and good all and sustaining costs. So both projects, you know, were standalone. So there was, there was significant duplication in facilities and, and capital costs and and in, of course, two processing plants. We're looking at, of course, combining the two, combining as well as adding the additional ounces that we now have in the in the new open pit areas, the expanded open pit areas. So we're looking at something significantly larger, but but really combining the same underlying 
rationale for the previous BA, some high-grade underground, blending that with the open pit material, getting the capital costs down, but, and at the same time, increasing the overall production. Okay, makes sense. And then in terms of cost inflation, I mean, we've seen studies come out over the past six months with significant cost creep between, you know, PEA to PFS to um, full feasibility study. How do you look at putting out a study in a, a cost inflationary pressured environment? Like, are you expecting a lot of costs from the previous PEAs? Or maybe you could just talk to uh, how investors should be thinking about your upcoming PEA. Yes, no, you're right. We we do see there is inflation has set in. We do see cost increases. We are seeing that, you know, across the board, really, in regards to both capital and operating costs. We will be using, you know, current relevant costs for the PEA. Remember, we will be doing the study at a, at a higher gold price than previously conducted. Gold has appreciated a lot. So that will offset a lot of the cost, cost increases, but probably not all. There will be some, potentially some over and above that. Remember, the previous PEAs were very robust, they're very solid. So at this stage, we don't see any major issues. We, we think we have those, we'll have those costs increased covered. Well, this will still be a robust, you know, uh, project. And I guess the other side of that question is a lot of companies are not getting value in the market for putting out studies and advancing the projects in a traditional way, moving through the different steps. How do you look at that in terms of strategy? I think that may be just a function of the current market conditions people are looking for you know for news for headlines not for actually de-risking over, over time the market is always efficient we, we will continue to advance we'll continue to de-risk the bottom line is that that adds value at core value and over time that will we will be re-rated according to that so i think what you're seeing is something uh, just transitory and over time you know as projects uh, move ahead at de-risk and thus add value value will be added in the market I tend to agree with you. We're in an interesting time for sure. As you develop and advance the projects, what's your intention? Do you want to build it? Would you like a major to step in and take you out? What, what's the overall strategy in terms of M&A? Look, okay, our strategy is to, to develop this de-risk it on our own. We're building up our project development team, our project delivery team. We will be adding some more key hires here in the coming months. Um, we have people lined up to join to fill in key roles. As we move the project forward, look, we are a public company. We're a junior with one of the largest, well, probably the largest undeveloped gold project in North America. So the market, as I mentioned, is the market. However, we'll, our interest is in adding value to our shareholders and continuing to move the project forward, de-risk it and add value. So that's our focus. And as mentioned, the market's the market. There has been a considerable amount of M&A activity in the area. We've seen a number of large and small companies being acquired and merged. However, we will continue to do our job and that is add value to our shareholders. Well, you are in a great jurisdiction. I mean, you say one of the largest or the largest in North America. I mean, when was the last time you saw a large gold mine get developed in the US? It's so rare for, no, for exactly. that to occur. Uh, sorry. Yeah, no, exactly. There hasn't been a number of any major new discoveries over the last while. So we're, we're really pleased that we've actually putting something out there that is substantial and large. So we'll continue to, you know, continue to develop and expand it and, and add value. Yeah. And I think we're seeing that the majors definitely prefer Canada as a jurisdiction in North America. So I think you're well situated there. I've run out of things to ask you, Gary. So <laughs> do you have any, was there anything you wanted to cover today that we didn't cover in the session? I think we've hit all the points. Uh, Deborah really was about the new resource, the expansion of resources the addition of a significant amount of you know new open pit resources with no loss in grade, the increase in grade of our underground resources, the addition of new underground resources at Garrison, which we'll, we'll be, we're able to expand upon. Now it's a question of um, de-risking the project, uh, conducting infill drilling, um, and moving the project forward. So yeah, we, we thank our shareholders and our, and our stakeholders in, in, in this ongoing support, and we look to continue to add, you know, value to to all, all stakeholders uh, moving forward. Mm -hmm. Well, like I said before, you've done a great job in the last two years really growing the company. And it sounds like you've got a number of catalysts this year to really de-risk the work that you've done so far. So I, I'm with you. I think over time, the market will value the companies that do the proper work. And yeah, so I'd say keep up the good work. No, exactly. No, thank you and appreciate the opportunity. Uh, thank you very much.
You're welcome. If anyone has any questions that weren't answered, feel free to reach out. I'd be happy to put you in touch with the company. And yeah, have a great morning, Gary. Appreciate it. Thanks.